This course will show you how to critique academic texts. Critiquing academic texts is crucial to improve your grades and enhance the quality of your academic work. All the techniques that I will show you are tried and tested. This course consists of five lectures. Each lecture is based on five critical undermining questions. Lecture one, is the academic text too general? Lecture two, does the academic text state its limitations? Lecture three, does the academic text state that something has changed? Lecture four, is the academic text outdated? Lecture five, does the academic text engage with issues of race, gender, or class? Lecture one, is the text too general? You can critique a text because it is too general. If you see a journal article or a book that takes a broad approach, you can critique it. We are not attacking the text directly. We are not attacking the castle directly. We are not saying that the article is incorrect or that the book is incorrect. We are just saying that it is too generic for us. It is too broad for us. It is too non-specific for us. For example, if your assignment topic is focused on the UK, you can critique a text that looks at the whole of Europe. If your assignment topic looks at the Bain population, you can critique a study that looks at the whole population. If your assignment topic is focused on the 1990s, you can critique a text that looks at the whole 20th century. Here are some examples of this approach. Smith's study is too broad to contribute to this discussion. His study is too generic, too wide, too extensive, too vast to contribute to your focused investigation. Although there is some value in Smith's study, his coverage is too broad to inform this study. Here we acknowledge that there is some value in Smith's study. There is always something we can take. There is always something we can use. But as a whole, it is not beneficial to our focused investigation. It is not beneficial to our focused assignment. To be critical is to be selective. I'll take this, but I'll leave that part. I'll take this, but I need to adapt this. This is being critical. Also, when you critique Smith's study, you are showing the significance of your own work. When you put down Smith's study, your assignment rises in value because your assignment is doing what Smith's study is not doing. Your assignment is focused. His study is unfocused. Your assignment is concentrated. His study is generic. Your assignment is distilled. His study is diluted. Essentially, broad approaches are harmful. It is harmful to some sectors. It is harmful to some industries. It is harmful to some areas. It is harmful to minorities. It is harmful to women. It is harmful to some age groups because it neglects their specific concerns. It neglects their specific context. From this angle, that neutral generic study can be seen as something harmful, as problematic, a hurdle to uncover our real problems. Also, broad approaches are unhelpful because the focus is too broad. We have a blurred picture like this building. This building is blurred because we are using a wide lens. But when we focus on a specific aspect of the building, we have a clearer view. We can appreciate the challenges and issues of specific industries, particular groups, and so on. Here are some examples. Johnson fails to appreciate the importance of focusing on a single industry. Can you see the negative tone in this critique? Of course, these are just small examples of critiques. You will need to explain more. You will need to explain why a generic focus is inadequate. You need to explain the benefits of undertaking a more focused investigation. His conflation of communities prevents us from seeing an accurate picture. You are rightfully making a claim that broad and generic approaches are harmful. So now your critique can be very negative. He has not taken into account recent studies that focus on smaller units. Such a broad sweep has limited usage. When you identify that a study is general, you can group it together with other general studies. So in this example, there are several studies that take a very broad international approach. 
you have identified some general or broad studies and grouped them into this category. When you group studies together, it shows ownership. You have control of the literature. The literature does not control you. You control the literature. You show that you are able to have an overview of the literature. This overview of the literature demonstrates your critical thinking. Also, show the citations. This is evidence for your grouping studies together. Each study is separated by a semicolon. The marker will appreciate the fact that you reference similar studies like this, that you are able to group these similar studies together. Here is another example. There are several studies that focus on the entire industry. In contrast, some scholars have taken a different approach by focusing on specific industries. You are showing contrast in this example. You have separated two strands of the literature. You identify that one strand has a focus on the entire industry and the other strand has a focus on specific industries. You can adopt this technique more broadly. Try to create categories for the literature that you have read. For example, it is possible to divide the literature into three strands, practitioner focused, client focused, and industry centric. These categories were invented by you. You realized that some studies mostly focus on a particular aspect, not completely focused, but mostly focused. So you categorize the practitioner focused studies, you categorize the client focused studies, and you categorize industry centric studies. As you start to read more and more, create a rough table in your notepad. On one side, you state the generic studies that you come across. And on the other side, you can state specific studies that you come across. Lecture two, does the academic text state its limitations? Does the text in front of you state its limitations? Limitations are shortcomings, flaws, problems. Most research-based journal articles state their limitations. The author of the article will highlight the shortcomings of the article. So when you come across these limitations in the article, you can use it against them. You can turn their limitations into your critique. You can turn their admittance of weakness into your strength. They opened the door of the castle for us. They handed us the keys to attack their castle. By stating their limitations, they have made our job easier. They have given us a critique. So we should feel confident about using this critique because it comes from their words. It comes from the authors themselves. We do not need to fear that our critique will be incorrect because the author has omitted it. This is an example of a limitation mentioned by an author. We are reading Mark Simon's paper and we find this passage. In this passage, Mark Simon states, a limitation of my research is that I have not detailed the complex web of relationships. Great, he's given us a critique. We didn't have to invent one or find one, he just gave it to us. So we turn Simon's confession into our critique. Simon's study fails to detail the complexities of relationships in decision-making contexts. Or Simon offers a simplistic account of the complex web of relationships. These sentences are just examples. You will need to go much more in depth. You need to explain why Simon's simplistic account is problematic. Why is it a problem? Here are some other examples. Johnson's methodology reveals the serious shortcomings of her study. Although Johnson declares this limitation, it remains problematic. The author himself points to these issues. We need to ask a question. Why do scholars mention the limitations of their studies? There are four general reasons. Number one, it is just part of research culture. We all do it from our BA, MA, PhD to publish research. It's just what we do. Number two, it allows us to discern whether this is a good study or a bad study. By giving us the limitations, they have made their study transparent. From this, we can make a judgment on whether this is a good study or a bad study. Number three, it allows the reader to generalize the findings. We are able to see if it is possible to generalize the findings. Number four, it gives us opportunities to fill the gap that was left by the author. We have the opportunity to address some of these limitations in our own study. Where are the limitations found? You can find the limitations towards the end of the article and some articles even have a dedicated limitation section.
Have we been unethical? Have we just cheated? I do not believe so. Sometimes the limitations are hard to find. We need the authors to come forward and be transparent so that we can critique their admission. Number two, it is essentially our judgment versus their judgment. Some scholars may believe that their limitations do not impact the findings of their study. They believe that their study is still valid. Their study is still relevant. However, we need to judge if this is true. Maybe we can't get past their limitations. Maybe we think that their limitations is not acceptable. I remember reading a study that had a major limitation. This study looked at the experiences of international students. The limitation was that they were not able to interview the international students directly. The authors had to go through the lecturers. It was the lecturers that handpicked these international students. This is a major problem. This limitation was acceptable to them, but it is not acceptable to me. I can critique the study for that. I would never have known about their recruitment process if they did not declare it in the limitation section. Once they declared it, we can critique it. Perhaps some individuals may state their limitations to preempt any future critique. By coming clean in their study, it could possibly neutralize any possible criticisms. So we need to investigate these limitations properly. Lecture three. Does the academic text state that something has changed? If the text states that something has changed, you can critique it by arguing not much has changed. You can argue that the change has been minimal. You can argue that the text has exaggerated the change. We constantly find in academic studies that so much has changed. Things will never be the same again. This is a new threat. Moral panic. There's been a paradigm shift. There's been a new model. This is a new theory. This is a new genre. This is a new perspective. This is a new epistemology. This is a new ontology. You'll see this constant stream of something new being put forward. So essentially, you can critique the argument by saying, calm down and carry on. Not much has changed. We have seen this before. There's nothing new under the sun. Matters rarely change overnight. Change is often part of a long process. Change is incremental. That happens over a period of time. Or do we even need this new thing? Don't we have these existing approaches already? Don't we have these approaches to deal with these problems already? Calm down and carry on. I will play this very short video clip from Channel 4 News with Akala and the now retired Jon Snow. Their discussion epitomizes this critique. Akala is essentially saying, calm down and carry on. We have seen this before. Yeah, well, so a lot of the research I did, when you look at scholars like Andrew Davies, who writes books uh, about the history of gang crime in Glasgow and Manchester, or Robert McKilvey, who's got volumes of stuff about the history of gang crime in Liverpool, what you see firstly is that this is not a new problem. Every generation pretends gang crime is a new problem. So when you look at the press reports they cite in their scholarship, it's this same sort of sense of moral panic, this unprecedented thing. When actually we've had violent uh, teenage youth gangs for 150, 200 years, maybe even longer. And the social indicators of that violence have remained identical for almost 200 years, as have the sort of facile explanations of... And violence. those social, social indicators are? Uh, poverty, domestic abuse, lack of education, so expulsion from school. So, for example, almost half the people in prison today in Britain were expelled from school as children, versus just 1% in the population as a whole. Among young people, about half the young people in young offenders institutes were at some point in care growing up, versus about 1% in the population as a whole. So social indicators have remained identical. Here are some examples. King's model is not particularly new. He merely adds nuance to Kreitz's older model of vocational adjustment. It is not entirely clear why Siemens and Down developed their connectivity approach. There are several existing approaches that can be harnessed for digital education. Is the academic text outdated? You can critique an academic text if it is outdated. Because it is outdated, it is only partially relevant. So you can critique the text because it is only partially relevant. Check the publication date of the book or article. If it was published before a major event took place, you can critique it. For example, a journal article on the extension of parental rights was published in 2018. However, a major law was enacted in 2019. This law was impactful. This law changed the landscape. Now we are looking at that 2018 journal article 
in 2022, that article is only partially relevant because it was published before the major law came into force. This 2018 journal article does not discuss the impact of the major law because it was published before the law was enacted. So now we can critique this outdated 2018 article. There are two benefits of declaring that a text is outdated. Number one, it helps you develop a rationale. You can distinguish your assignment or research project by stating that your work is an update. For example, several events have occurred since Johnson wrote about intersectionality. Thus, my study represents a much needed update. This gives your work much more significance. Number two, show that you are aware of the context. You haven't just picked this article randomly. You are aware of the context. Johnson's 2018 article was published in a period when you understand what came before the article was written, what was happening during the time the article was written, and what happened after the article was published. Think about the universe around the journal article. We tend to think of articles like separate and scattered, but we should think of articles like this. Everything is connected. Scholars reacting to other scholars, scholars reacting to events, scholars building on older theories, scholars standing on the shoulders of other scholars. Nobody writes in a vacuum. Does the academic text engage with issues of race, class or gender? You can critique an academic text if it neglects or only barely mentions race, gender or class. You may come across an academic text that does not sufficiently account for race, gender or class. It presents a neutral or universal look at the topic. There are seldom issues in which race, gender and class is not a significant factor. There's no such thing as a universal student or a contactless business unit or an abstract concept of a manager. We are not classless, ageless, raceless, non-gendered, empty human beings. We are impacted by our race, gender, age, class, location, socioeconomic backgrounds. There's no escape in this. So we expect to see some engagement with race, gender, class, age or disability, neurodiversity, etc. Academic texts should account for these things. If not, we have grounds to critique these academic texts. Here are some examples. Jones fails to acknowledge the significance of gender in this issue. The author overlooks the fact that race contributes to the highest rate of... Another weakness is that we are given no explanation of how social deprivation impacts. This research does not take into account pre-existing pre tensions of it. This research does not take into account pre-existing tensions of gender and...